Okay, so I want to start by thanking the organizers for the opportunity to speak today. So I'm going to tell you, hopefully quickly, about uh, uh, our new approach for identifying combinations of mutually exclusive alterations in cancer. And so as we've already heard uh, over the past kind of day or so, um, when you large-scale sequencing studies over the last decade or so have shown that there are relatively few statistically significantly mutated genes uh, and, and kind of moderately sized tumor cohorts with a long tail of rarely mutated genes. And so this is kind of a cartoon plot uh, showing you what, what you might find in a cohort of 250 to 500 tumor samples. And so kind of this corresponds with the observation that no two tumors are alike. Uh, they have different combinations of mutations. And so one of the prominent explanations for why uh, there, there are these kind of long tail phenomenon is that mutations in cancer target pathways. And so each of these pathways can be mutated or perturbed in numerous ways. Uh, and so we might actually think of this plot a little differently. Um, so we might have a pair of genes, for example, that interact to perform some function uh, where A is just mutated more often, so it shows up as significantly mutated, while B is in the long tail. And so this is exactly the kind of analysis uh, cancer biologists perform. So here I'm showing a figure from the TCGA colorectal paper. Um, and they group uh, genes into mutated pathways. However, uh, this figure was manually constructed, so there's no notion of statistical significance, which raises the obvious research question, can we discover the pathways? And so, you know, one idea would be to just enumerate gene sets and test them for overrepresentation of mutations. However, there are too many gene sets to test, and even if we could test them all, we would never be able to achieve statistical significance. Another idea would be to look at known pathways or gene sets, but then we'd be limited in discovering uh, novel pathways or crosstalk between pathways. And so today we're going to talk about a different strategy that involves looking at mutually exclusive mutations. And so to motivate that, I uh, have a figure from Thomas et al. Um, showing mutations in the RTK RAS signaling pathway uh, across different patients. So in this matrix, we have genes or loci as rows, patients as columns, uh, and each of these marks is representing a different mutation uh, in a different sample. And so you can see that relatively few columns have more than one mark or mutation, uh, meaning that the samples are mutually exclusive mutations across the pathway. And so one of the explanations for this is that you know, we need to have relatively few driver mutations responsible for cancer, and they're distributed across multiple pathways in each patient. And so as a result, we have approximately one driver mutation per pathway per patient. And so over the last five years, a number of different methods have been introduced for uh, identifying uh, mutually exclusive mutations, and it's a very active field uh, with you know, multiple publications from last year. Um, we're going to talk about our method, uh, the combinations of mutually exclusive alterations or COMET algorithm, um, which was published last year in Genome Biology and is a joint work with Sinta Wu. And so COMET includes a new statistical score that is less biased towards the most frequently mutated genes in your data set. Uh, it also searches for multiple sets simultaneously, and we show it outperforms other methods on simulated and real data. And so I'm going to start with the statistical score by giving you some motivation. So here I'm showing two different sets of size 3 uh, from the TCGA glioblastoma data. Again, we have you know, genes or low size rows, samples as columns. Uh, and so they're actually mutating approximately the same number of samples. And one of the earlier methods, Dendrix, would actually give them the exact same weight. Um, however, they're, they're kind of different in one key way, which is the top set has maybe the most common uh, mutation in glioblastoma, which is amplifications in EGFR, uh, grouped with two other genes uh, with rare mutations um, that are not known to have a, a role in glioblastoma. And uh, the bottom set has three genes mutated all at more moderate frequency, um, but that are all involved in, in, in cancer and glioblastoma. And the key thing to note is that there are many sets such as this one, um, where we have this most frequently mutated gene or one of the most frequently mutated genes grouped with relatively rare mutations. And so we need actually a way to distinguish these two sets so we can identify uh, these sets that we think are, are more likely to be involved in cancer because they're at moderate frequency. And so, um, in fact, what we want to do is compute the surprise of the mutual exclusivity conditioned on the mutation's frequency. And so if we had a pair of genes, uh, we could cross-classify all the tumors based off whether they're mutated not at all in the pair of genes, mutated in one or the other or both, and then we could use one-sided Fisher's exact test for independence to compute the surprise of the observed exclusivity. So what hasn't been addressed before is how to score a combination of more than two genes conditioning on the mutation's frequency. And so um, if, say we're looking at, at a triple, three pairs or three genes, uh, you could create a two by two by two contingency table where we have these two uh, contingency tables and now we have this additional dimension that's based on whether gene three is mutated or not. 
Um, and so then we can you know, go and look and see if there's an association between the exclusive mutations uh, across the genes. However, in this case, there are four degrees of freedoms, meaning there are many ways of non-independence, which wasn't the case when we looked at a pair. Um, and so what we're going to do is use a test statistic T, which is the sum of the exclusive entries of the contingency table. And so uh, with Comet, we have this algorithm for computing the tail probability of T for arbitrarily uh, sized gene sets, so 2 to the K contingency tables. Um, and that's how we're going to uh, compute our you know, mutual exclusivity score. Um, however, uh, computing the tail probability can be expensive. In particular, what we're trying to do is, uh, given our observed value of T, we need to you know, enumerate all contingency tables in the tail that have as much or more exclusivity and sum up their masses. Uh, the only con the condition on these, these tables we want to enumerate is that uh, they have to have fixed margins, which comes from our conditioning on the mutation's frequency. And this can become, uh, quickly becomes expensive. So here I'm showing you a figure from Zeltzman et al., uh, where they plot the number of tables of a certain size for different dimensional uh, 2 to the k tables as sample size increases, so it grows exponentially. Um, and while there's been previous work looking at uh, R by C contingency tables, these are two-dimensional. Um, so not as much has been done for 2 to the k tables. And so uh, we have with Comet is an algorithm to enumerate only the tables in the tail, and we'll use this uh, uh, based on our application um, to, to kind of deal with the, the, uh, the size of the computation. And so in our application, remember, we're looking for uh, exclusive sets of mutations. And so uh, you know, in the case where the, the mutations are perfectly exclusive, we actually have no tables to enumerate and can compute the exact p-value in, in constant time. Uh, in the case where we have approximately exclusive mutations, well, they're not going to be that many more tables in the tail, so we don't have to enumerate that much. And in the cases that we're you know, least interested, the less exclusive sets of mutations, we can actually use a binomial or permutational approximation because we don't care as much about the precision of the p-value in that case. So that's kind of a whirlwind tour of the Comet statistical score. Uh, I'm next going to describe um, how we search for multiple sets of exclusive alterations simultaneously. And so the reason we're looking for multiple sets is because, we all know, uh, patients have alterations in multiple pathways. And in some of our earlier work on the multidendrix algorithm, uh, we showed that uh, there are advantages for searching for multiple sets simultaneously rather than iteratively. Um, however, we do not know the number or size of the pathways a priori. And there are often many suboptimal solutions that differ just by one or a handful of genes. Um, and so what we're going to do is going to deal with these, these problems by computing the marginal probability of observing a pair of genes uh, in the same exclusive set. So for example, if we were looking uh, at sets of si or two sets of size 3, so each of these rows contains two sets of size 3, uh, maybe our true set, you know, the true pathway is gene 1, g 2, g 3, and g 4 and g 5 is colored here. But if we're looking for three genes, you might have this third gene uh, that kind of differs between each of the top sets. And so even though the values, you know, the, the, the combined statistical score doesn't change that much just because you're swapping out this third gene because you didn't know how to set the parameter correctly. And so we can actually summarize that in a marginal probability graph. So uh, you can see every time we sample gene 1, gene 2, and gene 3 together, and also gene 4 and gene 5 together, and that's exactly what Comet does. It outputs the high-weight subgraphs of this marginal probability graph. And so uh, we compute the marginal probability graph using an MCMC algorithm to sample T sets of size K in proportion to their combined score. Um, and this kind of lets us test fewer parameters than you would need instead of testing all the parameters for you know, whatever size sets you're looking for. And so we compared a Comet to Multidendrix and Mutex and Muex on uh, simulated data and showed how it performs these, these methods. This is in the paper. I don't have time to go into it today. Um, we also had an application to TCGA glioblastoma, breast cancer, leukemia, and stomach cancer data sets. And I want to focus on the glioblastoma and breast cancer uh, results. And so here I'm showing you two of the top four sets of size 4 found by Comet on the uh, TCGA glioblastoma data, which includes around 400 mutated genes and 261 samples. Um, and so you can see that the, the mutations are, are you know, highly exclusive. Um, this is the p-value of the exact tests. Uh, for both of them are you know, very uh, significant. They're also mutated in 90% and 55% of the samples, respectively. And so we actually went back and looked at the uh, corresponding TCGA paper. Um, so you've seen this figure before, but uh, here we actually recovered and the top set is overlapping four of the genes in the RB signaling pathway, uh, and this bottom set is overlapping three of the genes in the P53 signaling pathway. Um, so this is good, but it's, not, it's actually not the whole story, because if you go and look at the marginal probability graph, which again I'm showing over here, 
um, you can uncover additional structure in the data. Uh, and so, again, these uh, edges between nodes in the marginal probability graph are telling you how often they're likely to, the, the nodes are going to be sampled together um, in the same exclusive set. And you can see that when you look at the marginal probability graph, we've recovered an additional gene, CDKN2C, in the RB signaling pathway. Uh, and perhaps more interestingly, we find CDKN2A is kind of between the RB signaling set uh, and, the, and the PFD3 signaling set. And so that actually matches up with the figure from the paper where CDKN2A is in both. And if you go back and look at the paper, it actually describes how different uh, splice variants of CDKN2A are involved in these two pathways. Um, and so we actually, in the paper, describe this kind of hypothesis for how there are alternative ways for these two pathways to be perturbed. Um, but I don't have time to kind of go into the details. And so the other module identified by Comet is over here, um, highlighting some of the genes identified um, that overlap the PI2K signaling pathway in the GBM paper, and it also includes some other well-known cancer genes. And so I want to you know, pause here and emphasize that all of these relationships were recovered solely by looking at the pattern of mutations, so solely by looking for exclusive mutations. So there's no notion of interactions uh, or anything like that input to Comet. And so uh, I want to conclude by telling you one more kind of vignette about, uh, let's hide that, um, identifying uh, subtype-specific mutations and, and mutually exclusive mutations simultaneously. So we've already, already heard about this morning. Um, kind of well-known, you can cluster samples uh, by their gene expression. Um, so I'm showing a figure from 2003 where they clustered breast cancer uh, samples into these five different subtypes. And then later, TCGA, um, in their paper, identified mutations that are kind of associated with particular subtypes. And this can confound our analysis uh, because this gives another reason for why genes may have mutually exclusive mutations. They might just be mutated in one subtype or not the other rather than being in the same pathway. And so uh, with Comet, we actually allow you to do simultaneous analysis of exclusive and subtype specific alterations. Um, and so we have this kind of input to Comet is this gene by patient matrix where we're marking which genes are mutated in which patients. And if you know the subtypes in advance, we actually can let you add subtype events uh, that are mutated in all samples except those of that particular subtype. And so the reason we do it, you know, kind of the not of the, uh, of the subtype is because then when Common identifies an exclusive set that includes a subtype event, uh, you can see these, four, these three genes are largely exclusive with the subtype, you know, the red subtype event, and that means almost all of their mutations are occurring in that subtype. And so uh, we kind of let you do both uh, subtype association and this exclusivity analysis simultaneously. And so we ran comment on the TCGA breast cancer data set, uh, which includes four subtypes. And here's the uh, marginal probability graph output. Um, and so this, the rectangles are representing subtypes. So the lines connecting genes to the rectangles are uh, showing a subtype association, um, while the, the nodes, the, the circles themselves, uh, represent genes. And you can see we recover parts of the PI3K signaling pathway, as well as this kind of association between PIK3CA and luminal A that's well known as well as the well-known ERB2 and ER2 enriched, or PFD3 and basal-like associations. Um, so that's all I have time for. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, the co-authors in the paper, my advisor, Ben Raphael, Fabio Van Dien, and Sinta Wu, as well as uh, the research group I'm part of and uh, my funding and data. Thank you. So uh, uh, before everyone, maybe this can be a discussion item uh, um, for the afternoon. But I'd like to ask an immediate question, uh, which, which may, spin, uh, which may uh, create some discussion. So how often do you see uh, absolutely, I don't, I don't remember the terminology, absolutely mutually, uh, mutual exclusivity? And uh, among the ones in which there's almost uh, uh, mutual exclusivity, I wonder uh, if there's a correlation between how often you see the two, two genes mutated together and the stage of the cancer. Yeah, so I think, uh, I mean, in all the results I showed today, there's not perfect mutual exclusivity. It's approximate. Um, and yeah, we haven't gone and tried to do the association with stage, but I think uh, yeah, it's one of the things in terms of timing, like exactly. Nico talked about uh, yesterday. So why two, why not three, why not four? Is it, I mean, are, are we, is it a fashion statement or is it, is it really uh, some biological process that we're capturing? And I'd like to discuss, this. I'd like to hear, not that I know of, uh, people's ideas, maybe uh, in the afternoon. I think it's a great point for the afternoon. Yeah. Um, because I will also be talking about the film Thursday. So. Oh, okay, maybe we can leave it to Thursday.
because there, you know, there are some underlying processes that force the things yeah. to overlap yeah. on. No doubt, I mean, we observe it in our independent, totally irrelevant right. studies. But I, I'd like to get your opinion. Yeah, so scheduling-wise, we, we have some more exclusivity talks on Thursday. So it might yep. be a good day to do that discussion. Perfect. Uh, we have a lot of evolution talks tomorrow. So I was sort of picturing that we might have a discussion on uh, tumor evolution tomorrow. Um, this afternoon is still a little bit unknown. So anyone that wants to propose a discussion topic for this afternoon uh, would love to hear it. And uh, we have that hour. So I think we, should, we have a lot of the experts in the room here on these different topics. Uh, it'd be great to have you know, some conversations that are maybe a little more structured in the afternoon in addition to all the discussions we're having over the breaks and over lunch and one-on-one -on -one and in small groups. So if you, if you have any thoughts about this afternoon, you know, please uh, uh, let, let Jank or, or myself know, and, and we can uh, add that to the discussion. Thank you. So, you're free until two. <laughs>